Hello, and welcome to episode number 68 of Birth Words. Today, I'm interviewing my fellow doula, Katie Gardner. Welcome to Birth Words. Words are powerful. What are you doing with yours? In this podcast, birth doula and applied linguistics scholar Sarah Pixton invites you to be intentional, reflective, and empowering with your language as we come together to honor those who give birth. The work of Birth Words is to elevate the language surrounding pregnancy, birth, and the postpartum period. Nothing in this podcast should be taken as medical advice. Welcome to today's episode where I get to talk with fellow doula Katie Gardner about her birth experiences. Katie is a wife, mother, avid fiction reader, obsessed D&D player, writer, and doula certified with Birth Boot Camp. She is currently taking a short break from birth work to pursue her passion of writing, but is still passionate about birth and her journey that led her into the birth world. Before I go into the interview with Katie, I do need to put a trigger warning on this episode as Katie talks about some birth trauma and infant loss. So if you're not in a place where you're ready to listen to an episode that touches on those subjects, put this one aside. Welcome, Katie, to the Birth Words Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for being here. Or it's to fun. be here, not for being here. <laughs> Already using the wrong words on a word podcast. Well, I feel like, no, I like that you said that because I feel like people get so nervous about that kind of stuff sometimes on my podcast. I'm like, it is not about there being right words and wrong words, but about like choosing language that reflects the beliefs that you want to be reflecting with your beliefs. It It's more about situational awareness than correct grammar. Yes. And just being reflective and intentional, like, and not, yeah, like you're saying, situational awareness, not reproducing less than helpful language, because it's just what you've been surrounded by and you haven't really thought about it, but like being mindful about producing language that really reflects the perspectives that you hold dear and that are empowering and positive for you. So, okay. Oh, yeah. I love that. So Fox aside, um, we want to get to know you and your stories and your experiences and the role that language and words played as you have gone through those experiences. So do you want to start by just a brief introduction of yourself? Um, Yeah. Uh, So my name is Katie Gardner. And uh, I am a doula and a childbirth educator, but I uh, am kind of taking a step back from the birth community at a moment or at the moment to focus on other uh, projects that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, shoot, what else do you want to know about me? I was a sociology major (laughs) and um, I am... um, a wife and mother to my son, Fox, who is four years old. And then he also has an older sister, Clara, who died because of a birth accident, um, Mm -hmm. you know, during delivery. And um, shoot, what else uh, would your listeners even want to know about me? (laughs) I'm always so bad at knowing what people want to know about me. No, that's great. And I appreciate you just giving a little background so we know where you're coming from. And your two beautiful children, do you refer to Clara as like an angel baby or just how do you prefer to refer to her when people talk about, when you talk about her with people? I just refer to her as my daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, I know a lot of people really like the terms angel baby and rainbow baby. And, um, you know, even on my Instagram, like in the little Instagram bio, I talk about having two kids and then in parentheses, I have like a little angel kid and a mm-hmm. rainbow. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. I personally have never connected with those terms for whatever reason. Just feels like your daughter who's not with you right now and your son who is. Oh, yeah. Physically with you. Uh, yeah. I just, I don't know. It Honestly, uh, Clara's birth and Fox's birth were both some of the most spiritually 
and psychologically impactful things of my life. And it, summarizing their existence into just two words like that, I yeah. just, it doesn't fit with me. It fits for some people. Some people are very economical and direct with their mm-hmm. language. But if you know me, you know I ramble. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> you and can't it, put things in a little box. Yeah. <laughs> with a couple quick words. So going into both of your both of your birth experiences, how did you identify yourself during your pregnancy and then going into this experience of laboring and giving birth to those babies? You know, I'm not sure. You sent me these questions. I'm sorry. I, maybe I shouldn't oh, give a peek no, behind the great. curtain. No, that's great. No. It's wide open. <laughs> you, but yeah, you, you sent me those questions that I, I really did have to think about how I identified myself. Um, you know, especially how I identified and my relationship with my body and um, you know, my pregnancy and my experience and stuff differed so greatly between Clara and Fox. Mm-hmm. Um with Clara. I, I, you know, I, I just identified as a, you know, pregnant mother um, or mom to be or whatever. Um, and I, I was determined, I think. And um, when I got around to Fox, I was just because of all the experiences that happened with Clara, I was very disconnected um, from my body and the pregnancy in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, I'm not really sure if I identified at all as pregnant or, Mm. you know, anything during Fox's pregnancy. That's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. So as you're going into these two very different birth experiences, can you think of any specific words or phrases that were helpful for you in just like getting in the mind space to do the work of bringing a child into the earth, especially, well, especially in both cases, especially as a first-time parent and then especially as a bereaved parent with the experience of having lost a child, how did language help to prepare you for and frame those experiences? Well, yeah. Um, can I go ahead and tell the two birth stories? Because I think be that excellent. Yeah. provides context. <laughs> for sure. So yeah, with Lara's birth, I, I'm a diabetic. Uh, type 1 diabetes, which is classified as a high-risk pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. we can get into my feelings on that term later. Yes. And so growing up, especially around diabetes, um, you know, people are really, they're not even sure if you can get pregnant or whatever. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of misconceptions, I think, largely due to the movie Steel Magnolias. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but, and so, you know, there, there's a lot of these things. And so growing up, I wasn't even sure if I would have kids or mm-hmm. biological children. And, you know, so that was up in the air. And then, but I was never afraid of giving birth, really, because I also grew up with, you know, like my aunt did a bunch of home births, you know, my mom is a hippy dippy mom. Um, <laughs> I think my friend Beth and I in high school watched the, the business of being born and we just loved it so much. <laughs> and so I going into the birth, I wasn't physically afraid, you know, it was just a question of if I could do it or not. And then I get did get pregnant with Clara and I was very determined basically to prove all misconceptions false. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I could do it. I'm going to do this unmedicated. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. And the truth was the pregnancy was fairly healthy. And, you know, the labor was actually wonderful. I went into labor, I think, at 39 weeks and like five days or something like that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it it was very textbook. I, you know, went into labor on my own, no induction, labored, I think, for 17 hours. And everything went really smoothly up until um, the actual delivery when um, there was a significant shoulder dystocia. Mm. And, you know, I, there's lots of 
things that could have happened, you know, the actual way I was laying down on the bed, you did know, all these things. Um, and, you know, Clara uh, was nine pounds, which is, you know, above the norm, but also n- not impossible to deliver vaginally. And also just to get into the nitty gritty, um, you know, she, it was a sol- shoulder dystocia which is where the shoulder catches and mm-hmm. it's harder to deliver the baby. Um, but it was the shoulder dystocia that lasted under two minutes, which is actually, you know, normally wouldn't qualify as significant and significant being causes significant harm to the mother or the child. Mm-hmm. But it it did, man, you're going to have to put a trigger warning on the top of this. I'm so sorry. Right. That's okay. <laughs> um. It- but it did. And, you know, four days later, um, Clara did die. She passed away. Um, and so just going from the mindset of so determined to prove everybody wrong and then mm-hmm. feeling like I had been proven wrong almost, um, you know, it was very, yeah. it was a, there was a lot of self blame. There was a lot of not really understanding the statistics or anything else around it at that time. And so when I got pregnant with Fox again, um, you know, we were just like, you know what? Birth is great for healthy ladies. I'm not healthy and my body is broken, clearly. So (laughs) I'm going to, you know, just go ahead and, um, you know, have a C-section and call it a day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we scheduled the C-section with Fox and that it was either that day or the day after that. Uh, I went into labor naturally mm. and went into labor naturally and early and unexpectedly. And I was a hundred percent in denial that that was what was happening. Mm. Uh, and so we didn't go to the hospital. Um, you know, I labored at home. I, you know, slept and ate during labor and I walked around and all that other stuff. And I was convinced I had food poisoning or the flu or something else. And eventually, right around 1 a.m., um, you know, my mom came upstairs because I was making the noises one does when giving birth. And she, you know, convinced my husband and I to go to the hospital. And Fox, mm-hmm. I think, was born in triage about like 20 minutes later. Oh, wow. So <laughs> it's not the cesarean. They do not do those in triage. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> so it was wow. just, it, and it just wasn't an option because I waited right. too long. Um, and so that story, you know, and and that was really, I think, for me, what needed to happen, because then it allowed me to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, look at the differences between those two births and what happened in those varying situations. And um, also uh, allow myself to reframe and reshape the story of what had happened to yeah. me with Clara. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the words that I would use to identify myself or the words that would, you know, bring those up are so vastly different. And it's, you know, and it's funny with Clara, the ones that I probably would identify with would be the more strong and empowering words for that mm-hmm. pregnancy than I did with Fox. But, you know, it w- Fox had the <laughs> the you know desired outcome, I guess we would call it. Um, yeah. But sorry, that was a lot of information dump. <laughs> no, I keep that this was... under fifteen minutes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, lots of times interviews go longer, and I thank you so much for sharing those stories and for you know I'm sure that as many times as you've told those stories, it's probably difficult each time in a different way to relive that. So I thank you for sharing the story with me. Well, it, it's funny about those stories and it, it is a lot to do with words. I think, um, you know, if you notice at the top, when I was talking about Clara, um, I used very technical words Right. And if I stay in that headspace of like mm-hmm. technical words and very linear and stuff, yeah, it it's significantly easier than when you bring it into like an emotional processing the feelings and mm-hmm. you know remembering all that 
that that's a different box in my head. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So can you say a little more about, you said having had the birth experience that you did with Fox, that was not at all what you'd planned. It helped to reframe just your idea of birth generally. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah. Um, So, you know, after Clara, um, it, it was very much a, you know, I I can't do this, and I can't do this because I have been given hard evidence. <laughs> Here is the hard evidence. Um, and with Fox, it was um, very much, you know, you can do this, and you know, you can do this largely because you like there's no other option right now. <laughs> like all other options, and but you did do it. And you're capable and your body was capable of doing this. Wow. So you'd mentioned before that as a person who has type one diabetes, you were given the label of high risk for both of your pregnancies. Um, And you seem to be hinting before that you had some thoughts or feelings to share about that term. So this is, me asking you, what are your thoughts and feelings about that term high risk and how it affected your pregnancies and births? Well, okay. So the term high risk, um, I I don't know. It, it's just, it's very black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, and let me be very clear. There are difficulties and there are different challenges and aspects for a diabetic person when they are giving birth. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are different things that they need to consider and they need to be on top of their health and working with their, you know, care team and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But the term high risk, you know, you you put that in the same category as you do like top secret or you you, you see it in like big, bold letters in your head. Right. right? And And it's a very black and white term, right? You're high risk. You are doing a risky thing, getting pregnant, and now we need to handle you. Mm-hmm. When the truth is, under a lot, you know, normal circumstances, when you are healthy, um, when you are in good control of your, um, you know, when you're in good control of your medical condition, when your blood sugars, for me specifically, are where they need to be, um, it's not that there aren't things for you to consider or tackle, but you are maybe a medium risk or something like that. Mm. <laughs> it's just, I, I guess high risk for me, um, you know, it, like I keep bre- saying the term black and white and, yeah. and that's what it is. It's black and white. And it, in the instant you have that high risk label on you, mm-hmm. it puts you in this, in like in kind of a black and white camp with a lot of care providers and a lot of other people. Um, you know, they're like, and it sounds vaguely irresponsible to make this choice, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. To make this high risk choice with your body and the life of your child and all this other stuff. And I, you know, and I just don't feel like that's true in all circumstances, um, considering all the variables. My favorite um, commentary on this term high risk comes from Dr. Sears and book, uh, the healthy pregnancy book. And, you know, it's one of those week by week pregnancy guide books, but they talk specifically about this term and say that they prefer to use the term high responsibility. Yeah. I like that a lot. And it aligns a lot with what you've been saying, like that as a type one diabetic, you had extra responsibilities that you needed to be more on top of your health than someone without that extra responsibility, right? Um, That sometimes we hear high risk and we think like, oh, like I just need to give my care over completely to the professionals and we become less involved in our own care when really what we need is to be more involved and be having more of those conversations with our care providers about what do I need to be doing 
to take responsibility for myself in this pregnancy and this baby and make it the best possible. Well, yeah, I, I think a lot, another thing that pops up in my head when, you know, um, the term high risk is brought up is um, complex or, mm. you know, or something like that. It's a really complex problem that we have to solve. Uh, and I, I think a lot of times when that idea is triggered for a lot of people, what they think is like, well, it is really complex and I don't have the know-how how to do it. And so I should take a step back and, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen. I'm going to take a back seat and just listen right. to what my care provider is saying. Mm-hmm. When, uh, so <laughs> my mom's a therapist. Um, I worked in the mental health facility for a really long time, or not a really, a, a adequate amount of time. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and my mom is relational focused in her therapy. I did a lot of relational focused things. And, you know, when we look at a complex relationship between people, you know, when you remove one of the people from that relationship, it does simplify it. But it also mm-hmm. doesn't make it a relationship anymore. Yeah. You know, when you take a step back from your own care, you know, it's no longer a relationship. It's, you know, it's no longer two people or a group of people working together for the good. It's, you know, I don't know, Uber, like <laughs> <laughs> being driven somewhere uh, and you didn't even get to pick the destination. Right. That's a good metaphor. Um. Cool. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about that term, because I agree that it can be problematic to just take the back seat and be driven to who knows where. <laughs> well, and the other, sorry, I keep interrupting. No, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, but the other thing is, this is something that is at least common with me and uh, my endocrinologist and, you know, my healthcare team or whatever for my diabetes. But once you reach a certain age, and you're a diabetic, and you've proven that you know what to do, Mm. they trust you that you do know what to do with your body. Your right care provider will trust you when you say, hey, this actually kind of works for me, and I think we should look at this thing. Mm -hmm. Like There is a care provider out there that does not just want to dictate to you, but they want to work with you. Those are the good care providers that you should find. Yeah. Good advice. Cool. Okay, so we're going to wrap up here with one final question, which is if you had to summarize your feelings about birth or about your birth experiences in just one word, what word would you choose? So, <laughs> I actually Googled words when I saw this. Yeah. Um, and I, w- I was trying to find a word that sounded um, more positive than complicated. Mm. Um, so I, I think I'm going to go with intricate. Oh, uh, my feelings for my births are intricate. Yeah. A lot of different layers of meaning and complexity and yeah, perspectives to look at. Plus, I think intricate's just a fun word to say. It is. <laughs> cool. Well, that will be the name of your episode. Intricate. Oh, I named something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And one really actually last question for you, Katie, before I let you go. Um, I don't think we mentioned at the beginning that you are also a podcast host. Can you give a brief blurb about your podcast and tell people how they can check it out if they're interested in hearing more Katie talk? (laughs) Sure. If you guys love hearing the sound of my voice, but don't want to hear me talk about birth related subjects, uh, the podcast I do is an excessively nerdy podcast called Backstories and Side Quests. It's just where I read short stories uh, based on the D&D campaign a couple of friends of mine and I played last year. And it's just short stories um, and my thoughts on writing before and after. Cool. And I am super duper proud of me for doing it. But That's awesome. <laughs> I'm also bad at promoting myself. <laughs> it sounds very fun, unique, and very like you your very unique niche. Can they find it on just like Apple Podcasts, Spotify with searching for the name of it? Or Yep. Um, right. So yeah, just search Backstories and Side Quests on Apple or Spotify, Pocket Cast, 
I think we're hosted by Anchor. So if you guys are wanting to do just direct to the host, it's Anchor. But I think anywhere you normally get your podcasts, we are there. All right. Sounds great. We'll have to check it out. Thank you so much for joining me and talking and sharing your your experiences and your perspectives. I'm sure will be meaningful to many people who are able to listen. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Yeah. Talk later. Bye. If you're interested in sharing your ideas or experiences on the podcast, go to birthwords.com. If you're liking what you hear, please leave a review on your podcast app. For more resources about language for a better birth, subscribe to the monthly newsletter at birthwords.com and follow Birthwords on Instagram and Facebook.